Okay, we can start. Hello, everybody. Again, um, I'm Lucas. I'm Lucas Perron. I'm the founder of the, uh, the platform, the international research platform, SIM. Welcome to the seventh session of uh, our symposium. Here in Brussels, it's now five past four o'clock in the afternoon. I'm again together with Raffaele, Monnoyer, and Amber, the Munch, uh, welcoming you at the Center for Fine Arts, Bozar. As you know, it's thanks to the Bozar team that we can make this online symposium possible. Today's session is the first of the two last sessions of the symposium, during which we will focus on social and community music programs developed in the southern hemisphere of our world. And today we have three research projects uh, that will be presented, two in Colombia and one in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. After the short presentations of these uh, research projects, I will first have a panel discussions, discussion with uh, my colleagues and then following the panel discussion, Amda Biskop will be, um, uh, she's here and she will be, um, she will propose us uh, some of your questions. As you can read in the chat, um, your camera and audio have been muted and will continue to be muted throughout the session. If you have questions for the Q&A, please use the Q&A button, which is down below your screen, not, not the chat button. Your questions will only be visible for the speakers and the moderators and not for the other attendees. Very well, so let's hear the presentations now. Uh, Juan, Juan Sebastian Rojas is uh, our first uh, presenter. He's from the, the Juan Corpas University Foundation in Bogota. Juan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lucas. Let me just get my presentation set up. I hope you'll be... All right, sorry for the delay. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here presenting uh, alongside this uh, wonderful team of scholars. It's also um, uh, very um, important for me to be presenting today at this great event and to be presenting uh, this particular topic. Uh, so thank you very much for having me. Uh, this specific panel about SIM work in the Global South is particularly important for me. Uh, the title of my presentation, as you see, is The Sim Field in Colombia, Grassroots and National Approaches. And this presentation is framed within a larger uh, research project, which is um, the Music for Social Impact um, Research Project, Practitioners, Context, Work and Beliefs, which is a project uh, hosted um, by Guildhall School of Music and uh, a project that focuses on inquiring about uh, sim work in four different countries, particularly Belgium, Finland, Colombia and the UK. So uh, this is a long project. Uh, John Slowell presented some generalities about this project some weeks ago. Uh, so I'm not, of course not going to be talking about uh, everything and we're this is a project that is underway, so in this presentation I will only focus on the context part and the Colombia part of the project, which is something I have already been uh, working on. And the larger question that uh, um, frames the entire presentation is how does larger social context affect practice or sim practice uh, specifically? So um, just so you have an idea of uh, how I did the things that I'll be presenting today, there was a seven months uh, data collection process which involved two main techniques, um, a scoping uh, of public information, mostly through online searches, and a survey from which I am accounting uh, for 91 full responses. Uh, this was, uh, I have conducted some preliminary quantitative analysis of this sample, and I have just um, articulated some of the preliminary findings with some literature that mostly discusses issues about music policy and social impact in Colombia. So the preliminary result of this uh, 
first analysis of this big corpus of data is that there seems to be a notorious divide. And this uh, is a divide between large programs and small programs with an almost inexistent um, layer of medium-sized programs, which is kind of interesting. So this is what we are going to be exploring today. So large programs um, are defined as projects uh, or programs that have more than 50 workers. They are usually urban based or based in towns and municipalities. All of them focus on Western classical music. That, is, that doesn't mean they don't do other things, but that is absolutely their main focus. They work through school settings and most of them tend to have stable funding. Now, on the other hand, the smaller programs are programs uh, that can range from one person up to 12 people. So they are smaller uh, organizations and they are way more heterogeneous. You know, they can exist in urban settings, but also in very rural settings. So far away in rural districts and the musics they focus on are very diverse. Some of them do focus on Western classical musics, but some of them do focus on different ranges of popular musics or traditional musics and also brass bands, which is a very transversal uh, music practice in Colombia that can range from the most classical to the most traditional. And I think this is something uh, my colleague Sebastian might be talking about uh, later. Um, these programs sometimes um, function through school settings, but not only, and they tend to have very unstable funding. So what we see here is a marked a mark bridge between these two kinds of SIM initiatives in Colombia. So the medium-sized programs are almost inexistent and the large programs are the canon. They, are, um, they have been defined in cultural policy in Colombia since the early 2000s, even before that, since the late 1990s. And these large programs are what have become the canon, the norm of sim work in Colombia. So if the large programs mostly focus on Western classical music, the question is, is there some kind of colonial bias in Colombian music policy? Why Western classical musics, right? So uh, I just want to uh, take a minute here to discuss a very important uh, concept, coloniality of power, which was um, worked uh, a lot by Mexican post-colonial theorist Aníbal Quijano, as long, uh, along with other theories such as Walter Mignolo and such, who construct the idea of post-coloniality, right? So this idea of coloniality of power is uh, this 16th century idea that uh, basically seeks to uh, organize the world according to colonial notions of race. And organize the world means classifying people, classifying places, classifying values, etc. And this has been, uh, or was at least for a long time, it was a main project of modernity and the expansion of capitalism. They are just tied hand in hand. And we can see all these false dichotomies that emerge from such uh, a modern or modernist thought. Um, your classic um, colonial difference dichotomies between white and other, urban, rural, lettered, visual and oral, oral, which also applies to music practice, arts versus crafts, reason versus intuition. And in the end, uh, you end up also um, with the association of classical music versus everything else, right? To the right, you see some pictures that show some of the, uh, of the situations that happen musically in Colombia. So from this uh, perspective, you question, okay, Colombia is such a musically diverse country. So why are the largest programs for music for social impact focused on Western classical musics when there could be so many other things that can be accounted for? And this is kind of the point that this short presentation is trying to make. Um, is there a way that local cultures, the local cultural practices, their traditions can also be understood as sim, as social impact for music making? Um, because, you know, canonic practice may perpetuate coloniality. I'm not saying that it always does. It depends on the context. But then we need to think, what are the alternatives for places like Colombia that are, you know, not necessarily uh, a continuous part of the larger Western European cultural tradition? So do local traditions with explicit social goals, traditions that specifically seek to account for social change or social impact, can they be considered same? See, that is one of the questions that I, I'm trying to get at. And if they can be considered same, what do you do with them? Do you evaluate them? Do they have measurable results? Is, is evaluation something that works or will, or will have a 
let's say, a logical place in such a setting, or what do we do with that, right? So what I'm going to show next is just two uh, simple examples of uh, expressions of Afro-Colombian culture, traditional uh, cultural expressions um, that specifically address social impact situations, but they are not necessarily designed as programs or projects, but they are something different. They are very articulated to people's notions of ritual, tradition, ancestry, culture, customs, and other um, practices or realms of life that tend to be seen as more informal and not necessarily part of a project with budgets and schedules and uh, measurable objectives and all that stuff. So the first project uh, is the case of Bujan Rap in Caribbean Colombia in the town of Libertad. That's where I did my doctoral dissertation. And the second one is a project I'm currently working on, which is the Saint Wake for uh, Atochita in Bogota. Both of these uh, expressions cater for the needs of um, Afro-Colombian migrants, but also uh, of Afro-Colombian victims of the armed conflict, and they, they are intended to have a positive social impact for these populations. Yet, they are not a program or project as such. They need to fall within a different category because we cannot understand them in the same way. And that is what this presentation is going after. What is SIM? How can we understand SIM to make it more inclusive and to actually make it make sense in other contexts where maybe uh, Western or classical musics or uh, popular musics, mainstream popular musics uh, are the norm. Right now, I'm just going to show you a 30 seconds video of uh, the Atochita Saint Wake. So I know I have only like 30 seconds left, so I'm going to wrap up. This was just to show you a context of a traditional setting, a ritual that is also operating as sim, and it is built kind of in a hybrid space in between a project that needs funding and needs to write a proposal and local cultural traditions that have been going on for centuries. So how does this happen? I'm just very briefly going to frame uh, how we got there, and since the 1990s, just a neoliberal paradigm has been adopted, uh, a neoliberal reform has been adopted in the Colombian government, which has implied issues such as decentralization of, of funding for cultural projects, which means that projects now to be competitive in the cultural sector, in the emerging uh, culture industry. So that uh, motivates narratives of success. On the other hand, a huge national music plan uh, was responsible for sparking a positive coexistence in Colombia. This is a program that was kind of an El Sistema inspired model. And there's a lot of criticism around this from a renowned musicologist in Colombia that wonder whether it should really be music's responsibility to generate social impact or whether this is an excuse uh, for uh, the negligence of other cult, uh, state agencies. And finally, what this, what this has made in the long run, and this has decades, this is even before the neoliberal turn, is that local cultures uh, and local traditions sometimes tend to be depoliticized and framed as staged practices. Even though in their practice, they still represent deep communal efforts. And I just think that maybe some, uh, in some cases, we as SIM scholars need to be considering a wider range of what SIM is to be able to account for the power of music in society. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, <clears throat> Juan Sebastian. It's, um, um, I just read also about your uh, Atoshita uh, study on the festivities, and were so interesting. All the questions that you that you that you put forward so to, to for us to reflect on. And, um, we'll stay we'll stay a bit in Colombia and um, and. We go to Sebastian, Sebastian uh, Olave Soller, who is uh, doing also, who also is going to present a, a, a research that he did in, um, in Colombia. So Sebastian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lucas. Just let me share my screen.
So, um, today I'd like to discuss the popular wind bands in Colombia. I'll make a quick overview of the bands as an artistic, as a musical institution, but also as a social institution, what the wind band stands for in social terms in the country. Uh, since I have little time, I'll just focus on two main points. First, uh, the social historical transformation that the wind bands embody, meaning that the role shift uh, of the wind bands within the Colombian society, and with this, the modification of the musical structure and the organological conformation were part, uh, were reflection of the dynamics of the social construction in the country. The second point is the wind band, the popular wind band, as, as one of the most relevant social platforms to give access to musical instruction as such, but uh, more importantly to education, conceived not only as access to information or artistic instruction in this case, but education as, as Pierre Bourdieu said, as a way to make a more freer and more critical citizen and human being in this spirit of Cornel West that said that uh, education should be enacted every day. And I think that is part of what the wind bands put into action constantly. So I would like to start by pointing out what might seem an obvious thing, but I think it's important to keep it in mind. The wind bands were first related to the affirmation of the Spanish power. The, the Spanish settlement was also achieved through the imposition of a certain culture. This uh, imposition implied, implied, among other things, the stigmatization and confinement of non-European expressions and in particular, the prescription of African or African related um, practices on the merging of native tradition with Catholic ritual. The critical part was that after the colony and during the nation building process in the 19th and 20th centuries, the cultural and artistic assessment was still made in uh, these uh, Eurocentric colonizing terms that were the terms of the of the new elites, the new economic and new and the new political power. So the popular music was therefore excluded because of its origin. It, it was made by a represented a group of people that the elites uh, consider inferior and that they wanted to put politically aside. So this meant that popular practices were marginalized and ignored, or on the other hand, were co-opted, were finally stylized, as was the case of Bambuco first and Cumbia later on. Um, now, how the wind band, how an ensemble of European origin incarnating the colonization of the Spaniards, and in some way, also the political and social prejudices inherited from the colonial period, how that wind band could become an alternative to social conflicts and to the marginalization they in a way helped to create. Well, it was first and foremost through a popular appropriation, a, a reconceptualization of the, the ensemble. The band's uh, flexibility to adapt to different repertoires, the suitability to play in large open spaces, the association <clears throat> sorry, with festive occasion, all these elements favored the encounter with a bulk of practices and repertoires coming out of traditional wind percussion ensembles that were already present all across the country. Uh, they certainly fueled and nourished uh, the popular wind band movement. Uh, these are some some example of those uh, of those ensembles. Um, an important characteristic of this process was that it was mainly done by the musician of those popular circles themselves, and therefore in popular terms. That was not the case with other popular expressions or in other historical times. So the wind band movement can display today a variety of instrumental shapes and configuration ranging from six up to 50 or even more uh, performers. So in, in Colombia, the popular bond is not limited to a standardized concert formation. It, it changes from region to region. It can be adjusted according to a particular circumstance to different repertoires or costumes or needs or simply to suit the local material possibilities that are certainly not the same everywhere in such, in such a manner that 
conceptions absolutely essential in rural and popular Colombia that were in one way or another prevented or more or less prohibited during the colonial times, such, such as the, the spontaneous collective engagement, the community sense of the music, the festivity that enveloped it all, the sense of get together and celebration, the dance and the, the ubiquity of the gestural body, all these elements uh, essential, as I said, in the popular and rural portions of the country are revalue, are shared and are acknowledged through and within the popular uh, wind bands. And this is an essential part of the change brought by the popular bands because it made possible not only to suit those local traditions, but by doing so, it encouraged a, recon a reconsideration, a reevaluation of the ethnic multiplicity of the country. This cultural shift enabled the questioning, the challenging, and eventually the, the breaking of some of those pattern, patterns of cultural and social imposition. It, it has opened a way to accept and embrace a diversity and acceptance and, and recognition in real and factual terms of uh, the multiculturalism of the country outside some of those central impositions. The second element I would like to discuss is uh, the articulation of the wind band with this calling system. Uh, one particular way this is addressed in Colombia, this is certainly not the, the only one, is through the wind band school program, Banda Escuela in, in Spanish. Um, this program was first established by, uh, was first inspired by a departmental program of bands in the 70s, um, mostly for children in low income rural towns. Um, later on, it helped to develop a national program of bands and in the year 2000, it became part of the program, uh, Juan Sebastián mentioned, the National Plan of Music for Coexistence that it will actually be discussed here next week, I think. So in this program, the, the band projects are directly linked to the educational and cultural space of each municipality, uh, which brings official recognition of the social relevance of music as an artistic expression and as educational mean as well. Uh, it brings the, the knowledge of local practices and repertoires, the, uh, the regionalized context specific approach to musical training and the engagement of local and national government in the long term. So much of the success of this model lies precisely in this particularity that helps the insertion of the band within the social fabric. So the wind band is included in the long-term curriculum planning of the school and the town as well. And it could be go well beyond the physical space of it. So in this framework, the learning process could be established in the first stages on hearing and imitation rather than musical reading or musical theory. And the collective learning and oral transmission are favored. The improvisation is reappreciated. So the barriers usually imposed by the musical writing or the classical training in general could be in this way overridden. Here is not so much about the vertical teaching established only on the master-student relationship. It implies a multiplicity of actors on learning modes grounded on a multi-layer structure that goes further the, the instrumental instruction. The child could actually get an instrument right from the beginning and in any case get right there into the communitarian dynamics and the collective construction of the band. In fact, there's actually little or non um, individual training because the social process here is more important than the individual outcome. Uh, Jonas Lobot actually mentioned this when talking about the comparative study seems carrying out. In Colombia, compared to some, of con some uh, other countries in Europe, the, the primary concern is not about musical performance. Of course, there are ensembles of the highest level and, and performers of great quality, but that at this point is not the, the first concern. Here's more about the consciousness of being a part of, uh, of a social group, not only the band, not only the school, but also of a larger community too, finding through musical practices, a different reading of the world, a different way to interact with it, a place in it would actually space for them. Um, so to finish, I just like to stress that currently the wind band 
in all its different forms and configuration is probably the most important musical institution in Colombia. In addition to being a cultural epicenter, a living cultural institution of many Colombian towns, it is the only musical educational mechanism that is massively uh, present all across the territory. So um, this is a specificity of the popular wind band movement in Colombia because it became in a way a platform from uh, to the historically segregated communities. It was experienced as a contraposition of the modalities imposed by the dominant class. In, in short, uh, the wind band became a way to overcome the social stigma, as uh, Norbert Elias says, when the supposed moral and social superiority is effectively questioned, uh, the dominant dominated relationship could be could weaken. So the wind band movement in this aspect has proven effective in challenging the stigmatization through the legitimation of uh, popular practices and thereby a, a legitimation of popular uh, popular conceptions and popular forms of life. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we, we have many things to to discuss uh, later on. Thank you so much. And um, so I'm now giving myself the floor because uh, I'm. Um, <clears throat> I'm replacing uh, somebody who was supposed to give a pre presentation now, Marianne Hutchinson uh, from Cuba. She's um, she's um, she's had to cancel last minute uh, because her res research was uh, still in an early stage, and and the last months uh, uh, it was stopped due to the to the pandemic, the COVID pandemic. And um, so um, I um, I will share some thoughts about the research I, um, I did myself in um, my PhD research in the Kinshasa, in the, the, um, the Democratic Republic of uh, Congo. Um, uh, it's a place which I, I knew well already a number of years before I started my research uh, uh, in 2012, uh, from 2012 to 2016, because uh, I had been going to uh, to Kinshasa for Music Fund uh, organization, which is uh, giving support to um, to the music schools there and to social music projects, and, and that's how I, I discovered uh, uh, several uh, music music projects. Uh, that uh, that 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 I I've, I I met there in Kinshasa, and um, um, so um, uh, I, uh, I I made a career break and uh, and did this study um, for the University of of Ghent and uh, for the Faculty of Political and, and Social Science. Um, 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 Kinshasa for me is a place of uh, I don't know uh, that many places in the world, but it's a place where where uh, where music is is uh, uh, so much everywhere, and um, um, it's it's all over, and um, it's really for me the 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 place where I I, I find music is so so very present, and um, the first um, the. The two, the two projects that, that I, I worked on, I studied. Uh, one is uh, called Espasma Solo. It's a, it's, it's a brass band. Uh, um, it's in fact a community center which is welcoming uh, children and youngsters uh, who, uh, who lived in the streets. Uh, most of them are called uh, witch children. Uh, the reason for this is that they, they had to uh, to flee their own families because they were accused of being bewitched and uh, went out uh, to live in the streets. And, um, and, and Espasma Solo, this, this uh, community center, welcomed them uh, during the day to, to, to do all kinds of creative activities like uh, drawing, theater, uh, puppet making. Uh, and also very quickly, they started with a brass band because brass band music is, is, uh, is uh, very uh, popular in Kinshasa and, um, and so uh, attractive uh, to, uh, also to children and youth. And uh, over the years, uh, 
the project exists existed when I started to study already six seven years. Um, it was um, uh, the these youngsters they became musicians uh, in in this brass band. And, um, the uh, the other project that 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 I, I studied in Kinshasa is a very different uh, different situation. It's um, uh, a group of young men who were members of uh, violent gangs. They they are called Kuluna in uh, Kinshasa, and uh, living in in a neighborhood where um, a percussionist lives, um, um, playing traditional Congolese percussion. And uh, which you can hear when percussionists uh, rehearse. And uh, they went to see him and asked him whether they could try it, whether they could uh, uh, also try uh, playing uh, playing the percussion. And the musician uh, uh, then imagined uh, himself uh, uh, becoming. Uh, he, he answered them, "Well, I could be your master, but uh, it will be difficult. You will have to." Uh, uh, it will uh, it will cost you not money, but it will cost you in time and concentration. And uh, um, uh, the these young men have um, have uh, become musicians also again over uh, a series of of, of years uh, and um, and uh, made made this ensemble called Betambunda. Um, I, I wanted, uh, I'm improvising a little bit now because I wanted to show you several uh, little videos uh, on uh, both the brass band and also on the percussion band, but unfortunately uh, for some uh, computer reason that I, that we haven't been able to sort out uh, uh, over the last hour, it didn't, did not work. So um, my, 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 my big Big surprise when I started this study in uh, in Kinshasa is that uh, I only ended up finding two uh, two social long term social music projects in Kinshasa, a place as I just said uh, where music is all over and uh, uh, the city of Kinshasa. You can at least say that there are many many people who are in living difficult difficult in difficulty uh, for many different reasons. Poverty is really uh, uh, a reality and uh, those who should take care of uh, the population police soldiers politicians are those that you should stay away from and um, so i imagined that the two projects that i had come across would be just examples uh, out of many and that was not the case uh, and uh, my network in kinshasa being being there a lot uh, uh, Assures me that that uh, I didn't miss miss out on um, maybe yes punctual uh, short projects yes there there are but long term projects uh, like Espasma Solo and Betambona I didn't I did not uh, come across really um, I I want uh, in in this presentation to to let you also uh, hear well I will I will I will I will read it but we'll, i want you to to hear the participants in my research and uh, uh, the, the first thing that 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 i found uh, as an important element in in the success in the uh, uh, the realization of, of these two projects is that uh, there's a coming together of of artistic musical uh, quality of the of the facilitators of the musicians uh, running the, the projects but also in combination with uh, social psycho social uh, accompaniments and uh, this is what one of the um, um, one of the the participants in my research is uh, is one of the brass bands uh, says about this well we we always want to learn more but uh, we are limited it's it's like an almost incurable disease this is congolese uh, uh, um, for uh, but it cannot it can be curable our professional artistic Accompaniment was good, although it was not ideal, and we we experienced many turns with different people teaching us. Now that we are nearing the end of our training, it's like water that has taken several directions and and does not know where the mouth is. Um, and um, so, um, another another important element in uh, uh, in in my findings um, is that um, uh, the and maybe one also one of the reasons why it's just difficult to develop uh, similar projects is that uh, uh, it's about uh, 
to to learn to learn music is is uh, has to do with mastering, uh, mastering an instrument, mastering a, a, a repertoire. This is this is what uh, one other uh, one one of the the percussionist, the Betambonda percussionist, says about this. When I say that I'm the leader of my instrument, it's because it's something that belongs to me, on on which I work every day. My my work is what promotes me and and makes things work for me. And when I'm working on my instrument, I'm already in control of it. I have worked on it many times. It became almost like water. There's water again for me. And so when I'm in front of the audience, I always have the pleasure of playing. The joy I have is to be able to, to share the results of my hard work with, with people who come to listen to me. Um, so, um, um here you see the the percussion band uh the their the betambonda the percussion bands uh having worked for now yes uh, 10 12 years um they uh they're very proud of being able to 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 play music from 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 many different pro provinces uh, many different regions in congo congo is a, a very big country and uh and um, and it's also very big in terms of its of its repertoire. Um, another element in the research which came out of the research is that uh, that it's really important. Uh, you find this also with uh, Jeff Baker Jeff Baker's uh, work uh, on Sistema Venezuela. It's so important that when you when you when you uh, instrumentalize in in a way in if instrumentalize music in social music projects, it's important that the the participants also have a say. And um, and so that's to do with uh, um, um, with democracy. And um, this is what what uh, yet another uh, who is it? Uh, yes, uh, Betambonda uh, member is saying about this. Um, this is what he's what he's talking about is about the interesting democratic organization of chamber music of uh, small groups uh, making music. We can learn from I think. Who takes the lead depends. In our group, some are considered to be the best. We know each other well, and we know who is stronger than ourselves. Those who are the best, those who will take the direction. It's easy to understand. If, if you do not know better than me, you cannot direct me. But if you know better than I do, you will be able to teach me something and direct me. If you do not do things well, um, those who know better can correct the others. The direction can be in the hands of different musicians at different moments. Uh, this is what we call in, in, in social science, uh, the heterarchic uh, organization of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of certain types of music, especially chamber music. Um, last, last element in, in my research is uh, uh, the very surprising fact that uh, in, in these extremely difficult situations like Kinshasa, uh, where also becoming a musician doesn't make you uh, become uh, 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 have more more um, ease to make ends meet. Um, people continued to make music anyway. And this is this it has been a difficult but the most interesting part of, of my my research. And there again, I want to to give the floor to to one of my the participants of my research saying when I play music, even when I did not eat or drink, I will forget all of that. When, I, when I'm in front of the instrument, everything else does not count anymore. Also money does not count. I, I can play for no money at all, it does not matter. The only thing that matters is the enjoyment of performing music. If, if I would not have my musical activity, I might have abandoned my struggle in life a long time ago. I love music so much. When, so when I play music, even if I'm in trouble and have no money, I dash into it, take a dip and experience as an immersion into the music, feeling one with it. So uh, I see that uh, I have to, 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 st to stop, but uh, before I stop, I want to well introduce uh, the, the team that I have been working with. Uh, and this is, uh, I hope the, during the panel discussion and the Q&A, we will be able to discuss this. Uh, 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 I worked with local uh, scholars, uh, sociologist uh, Jody Bofala Boyo, uh, political scientist Dr. Pa Patrice Bukulu, and the, and the social worker Magi Jokaba. 
I can't imagine uh, my work, my, my research uh, without them, but it also uh, causes a, a series of, of difficulties um, uh, because uh, I can be happy that, uh, that Routledge uh, published a book after my thesis, uh, uh, after I finished my doctorate. But the problem is the book is in English, it's also expensive. And um, um, I have difficulties now sharing my, my research findings and with the participants and also with my research team in Congo because of the language and because of the, the, the expenses of a book. Uh, but I think I found a solution and we, we will be able to talk. Uh, I would love to, to be able to talk with that uh, about that with my, with my colleagues. Uh, I'm preparing a podcast uh, on my research in French uh, together with uh, the participants and uh, of my research and together with the, my research team in Congo. Thank you very much. So, so <laughs> I have to uh, come back uh, with you as um, It was a bit, I was a bit nervous because not well prepared, things changed at the last time and the last minute and so, but um, I hope uh, it uh, worked out okay. So um, to, to start our discussion, my, my, my proposition, first of all, uh, Sebastian and, and Juan Sebastian is that, that I, I see we're three people uh, in very different positions towards the, the locality of our, of our research. Um, and um, Seb Sebast Sebastian, you're in France now, but you've, you're coming from Colombia and you, you, went, you did your research in Colombia. And Juan, you are in Colombia, but you're in touch now through also this international uh, uh, comparative research with the Guildhall School in London and, and the Sibelius Academy in Finland and with on the Biscop uh, um, and uh, the University College in Ghent. Um, so we're in these three different different positions. Uh, um, maybe I can <laughs> throw the ball to you and uh, and ask you what what are your thoughts about this? Uh, maybe uh, Sebast Sebastian, Sebastian, can can you start with that? Being being in France and and going to Colombia, uh, knowing Colombia because coming from there, um, how how. What kind of dynamic did that give in, into into your research work? Vous m'entendez? Yes, yes, yes. We, we so, um, well, as you said, it's interesting because I don't have in that way that much of experience with like intercultural research because my research has been done in Colombia. Um, strangely enough, sometimes within the country, I could be perceived as an, as an out-of-country researcher because in some regions I, I'm considered as a foreigner, as an external person, and it has always been necessary the help of uh, somebody that belongs to the, to the community or to that, that part of the group I am working with. So that for one part i'm um, being in france i think it, yeah it has only opened the doors for research in colombia because i think i in my personal experience it has been easier to be in touch with uh, some people in the universities or with uh, the um, administrative part of the research we need the funding when coming from an external and international university so I mean, that is that should not be the case, but I think in my, in my personal experience had helped me to get more easy into the into the research. Um, what have you have you then also uh, worked with uh, uh, Colombian scholars uh, in Colombia? Have you have you teamed up with uh, with with scholars over there? Not really not in that sense. I've been I've contacted some some of my colleagues, uh, but in particular topics not like in a long-term research mm -hmm. uh, it's been more about the the relation with music 
for example. But uh, but again, with the, the wind bands, uh, the wind band research, I I know the, I know the participants here in France, and then they contact me with people in Colombia. So it's it's been a strange relationship in that in that sense. So uh, Juan, um, during the podcast, which will come out later this week, uh, we already discussed this this uh, this item, uh, you and I. But uh, what do you, what would you like to share on, on, on this question of you being uh, at home, uh, but also in connection with uh, with London and and Belgium and and uh, Finland? Well, that's new, of course, uh, but. Uh, uh, you, you, you have, you have, uh, Juan, you have maybe also uh, experiences with, with collaboration with uh, people from outside who come into Colombia to do research, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think this, this is a really interesting question and it's kind of like a meta question, you know, because you're not asking us about our research, but our, how we do our research, kind of how we move in our research social settings. And I think that is really important because just to continue with my point about decolonization, I think that research relationships need to be decolonized as well. You know, there's uh, the whole principle of, of post-colonial theory uh, argues for accounting for, for example, the epistemological histories and developments of particular places such as Latin America, which has a gigantic uh, body of um, of intellectual history that is not really that well known outside of the hemisphere. So uh, I think in that regard, collaboration is, 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 is not just something that is desirable, but I, I think that if you want to do things with a broader approach, it's almost like a must. You know, you need to, at this point, you need to account for other epistemologies. You need to account for how other people think, you know, about this, about certain uh, phenomena. Because, uh, and, that, and I'm guilty of this as well, you know, sometimes you just think within your own framework, right? And it, it works, for example, for national publications or for certain contexts, it might work. But if you want to reach like a higher level of analysis, something that can be maybe more abstract or something that can theorize a bit higher, you need to account for different epistemologies. That is why, at least in the, in the project that we are collaborating uh, in right now, the Guildhall Comparative Project, which is with four countries, I have particularly felt that need of, of, of getting to know each other's perspective a bit better to be able to communicate better. You know, sometimes even within the same field, communication is hard, right? Now, when you have a multidisciplinary international research um, team, there is a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of research communication, just to get things done. You should not assume that your paradigms, that your theories and your epistemological developments are the same for everybody. So that makes things harder and maybe uh, they take longer, but I think it's a way of making them, uh, like you yourself said, Lucas, more democratic, you know, maybe more inclusive and account for a broader perspective. Yes. Yeah. What, what you say makes me think of uh, another Colombian, uh, Arturo Escobar, and uh, and the, the more I thought about about the, these sessions that we are now uh, into, uh, called the global south and the global talking about the global south and the global north, uh, the two hemisphere, sounds like too so poor a, a way of looking looking at our world and which is so interesting about Arturo Escobar's uh, latest work uh, uh, where he talks about uh, multiversi multiversity and the multiversal design of our world. Uh, I, I experienced this also being in Congo. Okay, you come from a different reality, but you come into a reality where you can understand a number of things because, uh, uh, because uh, and a number of things you don't. And, uh, and then it's inter really interesting not to be on your own there in this place which is not your home your home place and uh, your home culture and but, but still uh, the, the there are two aspects to that uh, uh, for me it was I don't know whether that was for Sebastian also in a way like this it, for me it was sometimes really interesting also not to be from there and not to necessarily well understand things that are were considered to be understood and uh, and then maybe also maybe less questions or maybe 
uh, not necessarily, but it was also uh, an interesting, I could ask the stupid questions in the, in the sense that I could ask questions which may sound stupid to people from, from uh, Kinshasa, uh, uh, which, uh, for which uh, the answers were, well, that's their normality and which is, uh, yes. Okay. I, I think the external regard, it's very important in, in the research, it's part of the research, but uh, also in this way of decolonizing the research that we're talking about, it's absolutely essential take into account the musician point of view, the, the, the part of the participants. And I think it seems actually going in that direction because the, the, the emic point of view in a, in a sim research is absolutely fundamental, taking into account how the, the participants are feeling, how their lives are changing, how this is affecting their daily day-to-day -day life. I think uh, if we want to take precisely that shift in, in considering other visions, it has to take part of uh, how people are considering not only the research, but the, the, the music action that is taking place. Of course, to, to come to an understanding, you need time also. So it, may, it means that, that the research uh, you develop uh, is, is developed over uh, a certain amount of time so that you can oh. arrive and, uh, and, and come to some form of understanding. And uh, 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 Juan, you, uh, you assisted, uh, you participated in one of the activities that I personally think are the, mo the most interesting activity of, of the STEM platform, which are the STEM seminars. And um, uh, Anne the Biscop is uh, now helping me with the Q&A, but Anne, if you want to intervene also, uh, please do. But, uh, but one, yes, I think uh, the seminars, uh, these four-day seminars that, that we, we started to organize, bringing together a small group of 20-ish uh, 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 scholars, researchers, uh, did, did, did the, 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 the aim of this, of this, of this program is, is indeed to bring together not only uh, individual people, but also people from very different worlds and, and, and for a, per a little period of time of four days. And maybe Juan, can you, can you comment on this and uh, what it meant for you? Um, you were in, uh, in, uh, in Helsinki with us. Yeah, I was. Yeah, that was Helsinki. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I thought the seminar was actually really interesting for the same reasons that we just discussed. You know, it was this meeting of a bunch of people from different parts in the world, everybody with a different take on what is sim. You know, everybody from different disciplines, and through the several days. Uh, that's probably the time, that's part of the time aspect you were just mentioning, you're able to establish those uh, links, those communication links, you know, if you, if you assume that you're going to be understanding each other perfectly, you are probably not going to advance at all, you know, you have to come from the understanding that you've got to learn from baby steps what the other person is saying. I'm an anthropologist and an ethnomusicologist and a musician as well, but I'm not a psychologist, right? I'm not a social worker. So when I have to face these narratives, for me, it's a challenge, you know, but it's not a challenge that I will embrace by saying, oh, according to anthropology, what you're saying is wrong. No, you know, that's not, I don't think that's how you create collaboration. You need to learn the history, where those ideas come from, you know, and then you can find a way to negotiate uh, consented meanings. And I thought the, the seminar in such spaces are, are very important. Now, here we're mostly focusing on collaboration between what you already uh, called a, a kind of how I named it a, a false dichotomy, global north and global south. We all know these are categories that uh, are practical and pragmatic, but that don't necessarily reflect a reality. It's just a way for us to think about power dynamics, basically. Um, so yes, collaboration is really important uh, between countries. Now we're thinking geographically. But you know, that same decolonization effort can happen at any scale. Here within Colombia, there are a bunch of, co of Colombian scholars whose uh, way of working is probably more colonial, you know, than many European scholars, including you guys that I'm talking to right now that have a very clear and critical approach towards, the, 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 uh, towards that idea. 
So, you know, it, made, it, it goes beyond the geographical. It's, 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 it's actually, it's a paradigm. It's a way of thinking. It's something very deep, you know? So, yes, geography is one way of thinking about it, but maybe uh, while collaboration is important, I would rather stress uh, the idea of embracing different points of view. You know, not necessarily just internationally, but across disciplines, across, like uh, Sebastian said, with your own participants. Uh, two weeks ago, I participated in an event, and I had the chance to present, to co-present with one of my research collaborators. You know how great that is? You know that you're not framed as the expert that knows everything about the topic uh, and also who's accountable for everything, you know, but you have someone next to you that is your research collaborator, someone that knows so much about their topic as you do, only that you frame it in words that can fly through the academic world, you know? So, and I thought that was amazing because we complemented each other's perspectives so well, you know, that that kind of effort is the kind of uh, interactions that uh, I'm eager to see more in academia. I, uh, I would like us to, to, to discuss a little bit about this, uh, about the sharing and the, the sharing, the coming together of, of uh, the, well, I don't know how much time do we still have left? No, we still have minutes, that's okay. <laughs> so, um, yes, yeah, so uh, maybe, Am, um, do you want to intervene, say something about your experience? Uh, you've been the best facilitator of uh, different well, well, already. No, not really. But I have some questions, though, for the Q&A. So give me a, a cue when I can raise some questions from the Q&A. Well, you can, you can ah, go okay. ahead, Freddie. Yes, I, I wanted to, to talk about uh, about the sharing of our findings uh, uh, being from outside. Anyway, all, all three of us were somehow from outside and, and just this, started to discuss this. But, uh, let's have a question let's have a okay. question so a question uh, from jeffrey baker for uh, juan and uh, sebastian sounds yes. familiar this name yes uh, there seems to be an issue here about the definition of sim or what counts as sim work mm. and there is a, a, a range of questions actually could this term almost be extended indefinitely in colombia what would lie outside of sim uh, does this term even have any real meaning in Colombia? And if so, what might it signify? Who goes first? <laughs> well, I think actually you raised that question already, Juan. So maybe you can, you can start. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, that's a great question. And this brings me back actually to day one of our seminar in Jarbenpa in Finland. You know, what is sin, right? So I think that is a great question because, and that is the question at the core of, of, of all, you know, everything that goes through this event that is called the symposium, you know? So I think it's very important that we reflect about this. Yes, I mean, I guess the question, the actual question is what is social impact, right? What is social impact? And is that social impact produced through music or not? If it is, then it's sim, you know, but what is the actual social impact? So uh, in the cases, for example, of the larger programs that I was talking about, there is, um, there is like a pipeline, right? This is not something that, that they are making up, you know, there, it exists. It's a policy pipeline, you know, where there's a policy, then some programs are designed, these programs are implemented, then they are evaluated, then policy is revised if necessary, and then new programs are implemented with the new revisions. You know, it's like, uh, it's very formal setting. And there you can understand social impact basically as the way in which policy impacts society. Now, these other, um, these other projects are not 100% outside of the policy um, structure because some of them have to write some grants and they aim at making some money for having their activities run more smoothly. Uh, when, but, but, you know, when the funding is not there, the activities still happen. So this is not like a formal, uh, uh, it's not like a formalized, institutionalized kind of setup just as like the larger programs are, you know, it works differently because it's entangled with more intangible issues, just like customs, tradition, beliefs, you know, things that go deep into your ethnic identity, you know, into things that maybe have nothing to do with your concrete work that you do every day, but things that define you deeper as a human, as a person that belongs to a group in a particular setting that has a history, you know, thinking specifically about Afro-Colombian societies, for example. So there, there is social impact in a different way, which is what I was discussing just now. Uh, for example, the St. Wake of Atochita creates spaces for the construction of elastic identities 
that allow for migrants and forcibly displaced population to reimagine and transform the territory and the space of Bogota, which is a racist city, you know, that does not welcome them very often, and they need to create communities to be able to endure these mar conditions of marginalization with the consequences of conflict through uh, this uh, communal setting. So the ritual actually works as a way to creating a huge community of Afro-Colombian people that through those uh, cultural expressions are able to connect with each other and make their life in this new territory better. Mm -hmm. So how do, you put that, uh, in, how do you put that in an evaluation? I don't know, because this is a project, this takes a long time. This is not something that you would just do in one year and you will have your results to get the next grant uh, funded, you know? Uh, this is something that takes a lot of years, these cultural processes. So I do not think that everything in Colombia would fall under the same category, but I do think that we need to be able to consider social impact under a more critical and maybe a bit more open uh, uh, view. But I think social impact is the key. It's not, it's, it's, it's not the, it's the I in SIM, you know? The SI in SIM, not the MM. Mm -hmm. Sebastian, do you have uh, something to say about this question? Well, I'm, I quite quite agree with Juan. I think in that sense uh, would would we would need to have a common ground of what is the social impact we are looking for, and how we could evaluate that. Because as he said, there is impact that we see every day, but how we could evaluate this uh, in a in, in like more academic thing? Because I think um, when we talk about a country with so many problems as Colombia is, when uh, you, you approach the music making, you can see the social impact of individuals of uh, rural, really poor towns, but how you could evaluate to make public policies, that is another question. And in Geoffrey's um, presentation, those were questions that were um, put there. How? The, the, the making of music, the making uh, music, symphonic music, for example, Western classical music, in, instead of making traditional music, what is the difference? There is no impact, even do this with a, an, a, a string orchestra. Uh, th there are a lot of questions, and I think it's um, a field that could be developed a lot in a country uh, like Colombia, but maybe we need to find some some common ground to mm -hmm. go with the right questions and then maybe find the right answers. Mm -hmm. Okay, and maybe yeah. a related question, Lucas, if I can, uh, from Natalia to Sebastian. Have you explored in your work the relationship between the roots of a musical tradition, such as bands in Colombia, and social impact? Have, uh, oh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Have I studied the relationship between the emergence of brass bands and social impact? I think it's a question for Sebastian. Oh, Lab. sorry. So, but I so the relationship, Sebastian, between the, the, the nature or the roots of musical traditions, such, such as events, and, and the social impact. Did you explore this? Well, I don't know yet if I understand correctly the question, but um, I think in the chat, actually, there's a, a link an article I wrote that in which I explore a little bit of this relationship of uh, the traditional the genres, the traditional repertoires, um, the political construction in the country, and uh, and the wind bands because uh, effectively uh, there are a very strong relationship between uh, how they mm -hmm. were thought, how the elites uh, were uh, went. To, to build a, a particular society in the country uh, from a uh, Eurocentric colonizing uh, paradigm once again, how the, the repertoire were built. So we can see through the women's and through the repertoires how a, a, rich, a, a racial country, because there were paradigms that were established on uh, a a white people and European people being considered like the best. So, so I don't know if that was the question, but anyhow, there's a, an article and you mm -hmm. see some of this relationship between the traditional music, how they were treated um, 
by the government and by the elites and their relation with the society in the country. Okay. I have more questions, Lucas, if you want. Yeah, but I, sure. yeah okay. So one question for you actually came from uh, I'll be Kenny. Um, it's for Lucas. Is it very surprising actually that there were only a few long-term projects? Isn't this a, a regular pattern in social music projects, for example, because they are underfunded? Eh? So, and what distinguished these long-term projects uh, compared to other short-term projects in, uh, in the context where you worked? Yes. Well, there, uh, <coughs> as always, it's it's not easy to answer, give a short answer. It's because it's complex, complex situations, but um, um, there's certain, certain elements which for sure can uh, play a role. Uh, and uh, I mentioned two, so uh, it's, um, give an example. So I, I found several, I, I came across, uh, met several musicians who who started facilitating music projects in Kinshasa with uh, uh, children and youth uh, living in street situations and, and found that it was uh, impossible to develop it further because they, they, they came in and out and in and out. And so it was uh, impossible to do, to, 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 be, to, to get this organized uh, as, 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 as being musicians on their own. Also Espasma Solo, they developed this center in very close collaboration with uh, educators and social workers, uh, and um, and uh, and centers where uh, where uh, youth in street situations could could come and, and stay and live. And so uh, this collaboration between this close collaboration between between the social uh, workers and educators and uh, the the artists and musicians and uh, um, was was uh, essential in being able to, to 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 keep track of everybody. It's not yeah, it's not the right word it's because of course the these youngsters they 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 come into this music project uh, by their own choice. Huh? So there's nobody obliging them to to uh, to, to follow to to go to to, uh, to be part of these projects. Uh, but but it's uh, it's necessary to be able to to stay in touch with them and. Uh, and in the in the the Betambonda, the percussion band, uh, I found that the musicians running the band were, were themselves really continuously in contact uh, with uh, the members of, of the band, uh, calling them, going to see them at home, and uh, well, this is also of course something that you recognize in other projects, also here, here in my in my country in Belgium, uh, when I speak with Matthias Lager from the Ladybirds, uh, he's doing exactly the same thing in Ghent, uh, and. Uh, so, so this is this is one element which is really crucial. If you if you can't make that happen, this coming together of the musical artistic accompaniment and the social so like the social accompaniment, then uh, the project will, will not be able to to be developed further. Uh, another element is uh, the the difficulty of mastering instruments and the repertoire is uh, it's difficult and this is this is uh, so it asks for a lot of um, uh, a lot of concentration and a lot of uh, effort and but at the same time this this was considered by the participants in my research as a as a as a as a positive element something to be really proud of also if you work for for a number of years maybe several 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 years on, on mastering uh, a music instrument the percussion or, or brass brass instrument and master repertoire it's something also to be to, to to be proud of, and also uh, besides being proud, also to encourage you to, if you have this, this experience of mastering mastering this musical instrument and repertoire, it also uh, uh, was considered to be uh, encouraging to 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 want to master other other elements, other other things in their lives. Uh, but it's 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 uh, it's not necessarily only a positive element; it's also a difficult element. And, uh, it, being giving it, it's also an explanation for why why such music uh, projects uh, are not easily continuing. And, uh... Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe one question for Juan from Grasa. Um, 
would you say that the large programs in Colombia uh, mimetize or imitate the El Sistema program? Uh, hi, Graza. Thank you for your question. Um, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I would say some do, some do, but certainly don't. I mean, El Sistema is influential everywhere, right? It's, it became a very influential model. So I don't think it is surprising that some of the big programs here in Colombia actually embrace that same uh, ideology. But uh, yeah, I also acknowledge that there are many others that do it, try to do it differently. You know, we saw precisely uh, at this same event, we saw the comparison uh, in Jeff's uh, presentation about his new book on the, on the music schools network from Medellin, how just the Medellin case differs quite a bit from the Venezuelan uh, El Sistema program in some of the ethics and the participation and the politics involved. So um, I think, no, I think no, definitely. There's an influence of El Sistema in some of these big programs. Some of them do follow the model very similarly. They even have like this uh, person, director, you know, figure that is very visible in all their websites and, you know, that is like the maestro, no? That same figure. Um, but I wouldn't say uh, it's pervasive of the entire landscape. But yes, the large programs are still focusing on Western classical music. Even the plan national, the national music plan, um, the national music plan um, was inspired a bit uh, in that model, at least in the way it was supposed to reach uh, the population. You know, they just set up. Uh, brass band schools in every municipality in the country, which is, uh, it's, it, you know, it's a, a success and an impact that you just cannot deny. Every municipality, over a thousand music schools, right? So that is a lot. And this program was specifically designed to also account for popular music practices, traditional music practices, not in the same way. Like funding for these programs was way lower than funding for the brass bands program. And the brass bands program was framed as very open, you know, but, you know, one thing is policy and another thing is what happens in practice. You know, policy, you know, stays in paper, you know, it depends on what you actually do. And what we found out, that I actually published a piece in 2017 about the National Brass Bands Contest of PIPA in Colombia, which is the largest brass band contest. And what we found there was that the brass bands, the best brass bands, you know, they were all trying to participate Actually, no, most of the brass band programs were in one way or another trying to participate in this national contest, you know. So the brass bands programs in a way became, yes, there are schools everywhere, you know, in every municipality of Colombia. But in some of them, an academizing and very um, kind of like westernizing notion of what music is became very, very, very strong because these brass bands locally have autonomy. You know, some of them decide if they want to do traditional music. Some of them decide if they want to do uh, music from the romantic period or both at the same time. Anyway, it's, it's, it's basically their choice. But what we found is that because of uh, some other policy outputs like the National Brass Bands uh, Contest uh, of PIPA, uh, were actually affecting local programs because local programs were just aiming at, at uh, doing more and more Western classical music and caring more and more about, um, about the musical aesthetics and the product as such so that they could win the contest, you know, because that's the, the, the expression of success, again, the narratives of success, right? That is the expression of success for a brass band school. So this is, uh, this is back in 2010, from between 2010 and 2013 is when we did this. Uh, the article was published a bit later, 2017. But it accounts for how uh, the brass bands uh, programs that were aimed at being very inclusive because of some other aspects uh, of how the brass band scene works in Colombia actually managed to bring down a lot of the inclusivity aspects and started again privileging uh, Western classical music. And that had tangible effects because people at this contest, for example, locals from Paipa, from this town, they were used to uh, more like farmer based bands that would play like popular repertoire, dancing repertoire. And over the years, the contest became so serious, you know, that people were just like this in a town, you know. So if anybody loved or started dancing, everybody was like, shh, you know, like 
concert setting, you know, and that was not what it was, but it started turning into that. Mm -hmm. So the national music plan specifically addressed not doing that, but in practice, it ended up happening the same. And it, it has been addressed, but it's a permanent struggle. You know, it's a permanent struggle. It's a tension that it's very hard to, to you cannot let that go. You have to be pushing all the time or it's going to gain, mm -hmm. gain momentum and space again. Okay. I think I don't have time anymore. I have still some questions, but maybe smaller ones. So you answered some questions with this last uh, answer, Juan. Thank we you. Can, uh, we, we still have time for one question. Okay, then maybe a totally different question from David to everyone. Are there any good examples of participatory musical culture sharing projects between national cultures? For example, a group of England working together with a group in Barbados, he says. I don't know yes. who can answer this question. I, I, can, I can say something about this. Uh, the, the brass band uh, in Kinshasa, the uh, Espasma solo brass band, they, uh, so I've been with them several years, uh, well, not throughout, but uh, a lot of time. And um, I was really surprised at one point uh, in the summer of 2014, they got the visit of a German brass band, a German youth um, uh, who are giving, uh, support. Uh, they're supporting also the, the, the Congolese brass band. And they came to Kinshasa. And um, it was uh, something incredibly interesting uh, to see what, what was what the what what new dynamic uh, came about. Um, the the Congolese uh, boys and girls uh, in the brass band, they were uh, they were they have been working extremely hard to prepare themselves for the concert they had a whole series of concerts uh, uh, throughout the city uh, which was uh, uh, by itself already something great uh, together with the germans um, and they were um, learning from the germans but the germans were learning a lot from the congolese also not in well in terms of the, the music plates uh, so because uh, in kinshasa brass band music is uh, quite different from uh, the German brass band music. And so that was a very interesting element in, in the coming together of these two, two brass bands uh, for, for uh, a week or two, two, two weeks, I think they were together. But also um, in Kinshasa, uh, musicians in general, uh, which, uh, for sure also brass bands, they don't only play an instrument they also dance and uh, so the dancing was also what the Ger what the germans learned because the germans were uh, that's at least what you could say not so good in in dancing while they were playing playing their their brass brass instruments and so um, yeah there I, I i could experience a, a really interesting coming together of two very different worlds uh, uh, musical worlds and, uh, and many other for many other reasons, different worlds, and where uh, it was an, uh, uh, um, something extremely in, in, in interesting and important for, for all of them. Uh, afterwards, the Congolese were invited, and uh, the Congolese uh, bass band, the Kinshasa bass band, the uh, Espasma Solo, went to, to Germany. And uh, so there's a, there's a very strong connection between those two, the, those two groups uh, of uh, young musicians. So I, I really, uh, experience there that that such coming together at least again if the if it's if it's over an, a, a good lapse of time can be of of of, um, of great interest okay i think uh, it's time to stop the q a <laughs> and um yes okay I, I i have still one question i think we have a minute or two uh um I want Juan again. Well, you you've been speaking a lot, uh, but I want to say tell, ask you something else anyway. You started the. I wanted you. I want you to to tell us a little bit more about the sharing of the of of your findings and the example that you started to give uh, with uh, um, one of the participants of your research and uh, that you gave a presentation together with him or her and. Uh, this is, I think, an interesting, interesting pathway that that uh, for all of us. Uh, so I would like you to say a little bit, little bit more about this. 
Yes, Lucas, thank you. Um, well, uh, yes, I think that, that precisely that, you know, like returning our research results, uh, it's a challenge because it's not expected, right? Mm. Uh, the model is built uh, as an extractive model, you know, where you go, yeah. get some knowledge and just take it somewhere else, just like with oil or woods or whatever, you know? So uh, actually returning it is different. You know, it's, it's hard and universities won't pay you for that. You know, that in, the, in your academic products that are going to build up your career and your promotions and all that, that is not really the kind of thing that gives you a lot of points, you know? So it's extra work. Translating mm -hmm. is extra work, you know? Learning another language is extra work. All of those things are extra work, but they make uh, the academic practice way more inclusive. And um, so, um, I have faced the same challenges as you, thinking and trying to do this. And to me, I have to be honest, like my main uh, obstacle for getting to do this better is just lack of funds to do it properly. You know, if that should be part of the research, you know, project. No, okay, now in the next six months, you're gonna do this many events, you're gonna travel, you're gonna co-write, you're going to do all these things with your research collaborators, but it is not expected, you know, like scholarly knowledge is for scholars. And um, so... <laughs> Let's. I have to interrupt you because we are we 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 don't uh, we want to to finish in time. But but Sorry. it's good to 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 stop with these words. No, to, uh, one uh, because uh, you and I and uh, Sebastian for sure as well. We think this uh, uh, this inventing ways of being able to share our findings uh, mm. is 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 a very important element of our work. Yes. So before closing this session, um, we can now listen and, and look at uh, a short five minute video of a community music project. Uh, uh, it's called Sound Roots and it's from Ghent, uh, the, the Kuh in Ghent, uh, this place. And it's a community music project, uh, a part of a European project with partners of, in Germany, Greece, Spain, Italy, and, and also Belgium. And it's offering, uh, this program is offering local and refugee musicians uh, from, from, the, from the South, the uh, Southern Hemisphere, uh, as we call it, the opportunity to play together in a professional environment. So it's again, uh, well, Kawam, it's uh, again also maybe a, a different look at what, what a social music project can be, a community music project can be. Uh, it's... Um, it's a, a musical tra trajectory in which musicians learn from each other and can thus expand their musical range uh, and searching together for, for a, a shared intercultural musical language. Uh, so it's professional musicians coming from their very different worlds. And uh, um, <clears throat> the Belgian Sound Roots project is sponsored by Fondation Futur 21. I, uh, I profit to name them because they're also a sponsor of the same platform. So let's listen and look at this video.
والأرض يسلم شفي عقب الفعيون تيز والأرض يسلم شفي عقب الفعيون Thank you. Thank you to the team of the Cour in Ghent for this fine musical closure of today's session. And thank you, Juan Sebastian, Sebastian, Anne, Raphael, and Amber for your precious contributions today. Next week, Tuesday, the 9th of March, Maria Maino will chair the second session on, on research uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. And um, I uh, uh, if you if you listen to our sim podcast, you can later this week find two new episodes in introducing uh, these last sessions of the symposium. We have, uh, uh, in the meantime, about uh, more than 500 listeners, uh, even though we only started two months ago with a with a podcast. You can find anyway all the the details on the websites of Sim and of Bozart. I hope you will be with us again for the, the last session of the symposium next week. Bye.